Okay, good morning, everybody. We want to welcome everyone back to the second phase of the Universita del Estudio Firenze and the UC San Diego uh, lectures on decline. Um, this is a, a combined project that grows out of a, a, a relationship, a partnership that the two institutions have. And we wanted to make this available to everyone who's interested in the topic and make this a kind of international collaborative project. So. Um, we did a series of lectures in the spring, and then we took a nice break for the summer, given the situation. I think everybody could, could use a break in the summer. Um, and I'm very happy that today we're starting up the second phase of this. Uh, and I will turn things over to Professor um, Veronica Bucciantini uh, from Firenze, who can introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, welcome opportunity to introduce Professor Robinson. And another time, I would like uh, to thank also Iwa Watts and Giovanni Cecconi for involving me in this important project. Uh, I am very honored to present to you Eric Robinson, uh, Professor of History uh, at Indiana University, where he teaches ancient Greek and Roman history from 2006. He was before professor of history and classics at Harvard University for many years. He is author of the book, of many books, and I would like to quote the first democracies, early popular government outside Athens of 1997 and uh, ancient Greek democracy from 2004 and democracy behind Athens, popular government of the Greek classical age of 2011. He also published uh, many articles on the connections between ancient and modern politics, war and imperialism. He is currently writing a book on Sparta's unique military reputation and he is editing with Valentina Arena the volume one, the volume first of the Cambridge History of Democracy. I would just like to mention a, a huge amount of papers, a very uh, interesting one for me, <laughs> a very, very uh, important article of, uh, um, from the uh, 2001 about reading and misreading the ancient evidence of the democratic peace, where uh, Professor Robinson suggested very new, uh, interesting new ideas. I am very uh, happy this uh, uh, today to give the floor with pleasure to Professor Eric Robinson, uh, who will uh, speak about uh, uh, the topic of the project. And the, the title of this evening uh, paper is Did Classical Sparta Decline and Fall or Just Fall? Please. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I wanna thank the organizers of this wonderful lecture series on decline in antiquity for putting it together and uh, inviting me. Um, I also wanna thank those of you who've joined today to hear my contribution. I hope it doesn't lower the level of discourse too much. Um, I want to um, note that I am putting into the chat, uh, let's see if I did that right. I'm putting into the chat, um, a uh, sort of basically a handout, a virtual handout. Uh, it shoots a link to a Google Doc that hopefully everyone can get to just so that um, you can, uh, I can mention notes. Um, and uh, uh, as I'm going along reading the, uh, the lecture. So here goes. Um, the idea that in the normal course of events, empires and hegemonies decline and fall is deeply ingrained in historians. Whether one thinks of the later history of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Qing Dynasty, or other great powers across many eras, 
but often finds a clearly perceptible decline in influence or in territory controlled before the regime finally collapses. The hegemony Sparta wielded in classical Greece, on the other hand, seems to invert this expectation. Instead of declining, then falling, Sparta fell, then declined. I'll explain. For 150 to 200 years, from the late Archaic period to the 360s BC, Sparta was either the dominant power in mainland Greece or one of two such powers. It shared hegemony with the Athenians in the mid, -fifth, mid to late fifth century when the Athenian empire was at its height. The rest of the time, starting with Sparta's exertion of control over the Peloponnese in the mid sixth century, it's to its lone superpower status after defeating the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War in 404, Sparta enjoyed by far the greatest influence of any mainland Greek city-state. Plutarch proclaims at Lycurgus 30, that Sparta's control was such that it could settle wars and overthrow tyrannical regimes merely by dispatching an envoy with a message. Surely an exaggeration, but scholars do not doubt Sparta's leading status in this era. However, Sparta's hegemony came to an abrupt halt after Epaminondas and the Thebans defeated the Spartans decisively at the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC. Invasions of Sparta's home territory by the Thebans and their allies in 370 and 369 left Sparta crippled, with Mycenae and its many helots turned into a permanently hostile state, and most of the Arcadians to the north, newly united in a federal league, put together specifically to block Spartan ambitions. The Spartans found themselves suddenly without the alliances, resources, or manpower that for over 150 years it had used to dominate the Peloponnese and exercise leadership in the broader Greek world. Sparta became a second-rate power almost overnight. This is the fall I'm referring to. But of course, Sparta did not disappear when it suddenly lost its hegemony. It remained a locally important city-state. However, as it struggled feebly and ineffectually to reclaim Mycenae, it declined into political irrelevance in the following years and centuries. Brief moments of greater influence under leaders like Arius or Cleomenes did not disrupt the inexorable regression ushered in with the collapse after Leuctra. Thus, fall and decline rather than decline and fall. Modern scholars studying the end of Sparta's period of hegemony in Greece recognize the suddenness of it and have sought to understand what led to it. But in doing so, some of them have slipped, perhaps unconsciously, into the language of decline. Yes, the defeat at Leuctra was a shock, they agree, and the collapse thereafter abrupt. But perhaps in retrospect, we can see that Sparta had been declining all along. Valerie French titles one article, The Spartan Family and the Spartan Decline, arguing therein that long-term changes in Spartan society altered Spartan mothering and child-rearing practices, negatively affecting the ability of Spartan men to continue to succeed under the strict Lycurgan system. Timothy Duran, in his recent book, Spartan Oliganthropy, directly ties Spartan power to its population level. When it was falling, as it was for most of the classical period, Sparta was robbed of its power. Leuctra was lost because of this long-term trend in declining manpower and a consequent over-reliance on reluctant allies to fill out the battle line. And Paul Cartledge, in his seminal study, Agesilaus and the Crisis of Sparta, argues that, quote, the basis of Spartan power was being steadily eroded throughout the 30 years prior to Leuctra. And he considers um, Spartan's he Sparta's hegemony at this time ever more precarious. Handout number one for these works. I want to disagree with analyses of this kind that use the language of decline for two reasons. The first is that, as I've noted already, Sparta was at the peak of its influence when it suffered its catastrophic fall. Paul Cartledge in the same volume admits as much when he states that, quote, for 30 years, almost without sensible interruption, Agesilaus presided over the most powerful single state in old Greece, unquote. It's note two. And it wasn't just the singular achievement of defeating and dismantling the Athenian Empire in the Peloponnesian War that showed Sparta's dominating status. In the following years, it would fight to a standstill the combined power of all the other most significant mainland states, Thebes, Argos, Corinth, and Athens, all supported by the Persians, 
in the Corinthian War. The common peace that followed in 387 left Sparta predominant for years. And immediately before Leuctra, Sparta had managed to get the Greeks to agree to another common peace that let Sparta retain um, all its power and possessions in the Peloponnese, but would deny Thebes control of Boeotia. The succeeding Leuctra campaign, in which most expected Sparta to once again humiliate Thebes, perhaps even take it over as it had when it captured the Cadmea in 382, shocked the Greek world with its result of the rout of Spartan forces. So this is my first objection to using the language of decline with Sparta. When it fell, it was demonstrably not in a state of decay, but at the apogee of its influence. My second objection is that by talking of Spartan decline, we obscure a question that truly needs answering. How did Sparta manage to maintain its exalted position for decades and decades, despite weaknesses that should have crippled it, but seemed barely to touch it? Cartledge and Duran and French, not to mention Forrest and Hamilton and Velvi and too many others to name, note three, have cataloged the numerous issues that threatened to derail Spartan primacy in the years before its collapse, but somehow never did until Leuctra. Why not? What permitted Sparta to continuously defeat its foes and intimidate allies, but then stopped working after 371? For the rest of this paper, I would like to sketch an answer to this question based on my research into Sparta's unique military reputation. You see, I believe that it was not so much actual skill in arms that explained Sparta's power and influence during its hegemony, though the Spartans were undoubtedly skilled, but the fear of the Spartans and their reputation for invincibility in battle that created additional successes, intimidated foes, and kept allies in line. This fear vanished after Leuctra, enabling the shockingly swift collapse. I'll begin by reviewing the manifold problems Sparta faced in the decades before its fall, problems that should have held it back from exercising preeminence in Greece, but evidently did not do so until Leuctra. Modern analysts of Spartan debilities take their cue from ancient authors who have a lot to say about what ailed Sparta in the fifth and fourth centuries BC. Xenophon, writing moralistically in the constitution of the Lacedaemonians, claims that the Spartans had fallen away from Lycurgan strictures, becoming too fond of rule over others after the Peloponnesian War and acquiring lax habits in the process. Aristotle differs in that he traces Sparta's problems back to the Lycurgan order itself but also sees mounting difficulties over time. Sparta focused too much on war and conquest and its property rules meant that in recent times, women had gained too much wealth and too much power, leading to a waning martial spirit among the men and an artificially low citizen population. Plutarch repeats themes from both authors, writing of increasing greed infecting the body politic after Sparta's triumph in the Peloponnesian War, as well as land concentrating in too few hands leading to too few citizens. Note four for these citations. These are not comprehensive. These are just some of the highlights. The manpower decline noted by Aristotle and Plutarch is especially emphasized by many modern scholars, including Cartledge, Hodkinson, and Duran. Calculations of the numbers of Spartiate troops sent to major battles from 479 to 371 show a decline in the total potential Spartiate levy Levy from 7,500 to 8,000 in 479 to something like 2,500 to 3,500 in 418 to only between 1,000 and 1,500 before Leuctra. Note five. The most dramatic drop off occurred after the earthquake that devastated Sparta in the 460s, killing many thousands. But the population continued to drop thereafter, due in part to constant warfare and to Spartan land ownership patterns that shrunk the number of plots sizable enough to support Spartiates and their mandatory mass contributions. Other problems began to accrue after the Peloponnesian War, including demonstrable class tensions between Spartiates and lower class citizens, and an aggressive foreign policy characterized by forceful interventions among allies and enemies alike, leading to increasing hostility against the Spartans generally, with a special hatred reserved for them on the part of the Thebans. These are generally convincing arguments. And I believe they show that Sparta, for all its dominating influence from 401, 404 to 371, stood on a precipice, 
With a shrinking number of elite Spartiate warriors, Sparta was forced to rely ever more on less trained and less committed non-citizen Spartans, Neodamodes, Hupomaiones, and Perioikoi, plus its large system of allies, many of whom had come to resent Spartan high-handedness. If anything should happen to take away these legions of non-Spartiates fighting for Sparta, the edifice could come crashing down. And of course it did after Leuctra. My theory is that Sparta's reputation for military strength, its image as the consummate winner in Greek land warfare, explains how it was able to continue to exert dominating power in Greece for decades in the face of its growing social and military problems. The benefits of its reputation were both military and political. Battles were won because of it. Alliances were forged. Foes backed down rather than fight, not because the Spartans truly were invincible, their record shows plenty of defeats to go with their victories, but because of the assumption that the Spartans were invincible or near enough that it was not worth risking a clash. Two different arguments support this idea, one based on modern theory, which I will briefly summarize, and one based on ancient testimony, which I'll go through in a bit more detail. In terms of modern theory, scholarly work among international relations specialists suggests that a state can develop a persistent reputation that other states will factor into their decision-making. Jonathan Mercer's landmark study, Reputation and International Politics, revised earlier simplistic notions about state uh, reputation formation by employing well-researched social psychological notions such as over-attribution, the actor-observer difference, and the self-serving bias. He posited that acting states can earn reputations based on observer states' judgments about their behavior in international crises over time. Mercer wasn't testing for military reputation specifically, but other political science researchers since, including Daryl Press, and Catherine McNabb Cochran have done so. Press establishes that when weighing military interventions, political leaders tend to place more value on the perceived martial capability of their potential foes than other factors such as their foes resolve. Cochran goes further. She analyzes data sets of interstate conflicts from the last 200 plus years to argue that states which fought well in wars gained a reputation for combat skill that depressed the likelihood of other states challenging them in future conflicts. Simply winning wars did not necessarily deter challenge. It was rather fighting with skill, defined as inflicting more harm on your enemies than you yourself received. That builds an efficacious military reputation. Note six. These modern theoretical and statistical analyses are potentially telling with regard to the Spartans who won undying fame for their brave exploits at Thermopylae, a defeat, as much as for those at Plataea, a victory. Overall, it's safe to say that the reputation of Spartan hoplites for fighting skill and valor was unmatched in Greece, as many ancient authors assert, including Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, Plato, Aristotle, Diodorus, and Plutarch. But did Greeks, confronted with the exalted fighting reputation of the Spartans, act in the ways that Press and Cochrane suggest their modern counterparts have, changing their behavior in consequence of it. The evidence, I believe, shows that they did. And here's the second and more important part of my argument. Ancient accounts suggest that Sparta's unusual reputation had an impact both on the battlefield and more broadly on alliances and war making. To start on the battlefield, Ancient historical writers indicate that the sterling reputation of the Spartans gave them victory almost before the battle began in three different major hoplite confrontations. Mantinea in 418, Coronea in 394, and the Tearless Battle of 368. Enemy soldiers who were lined up directly opposite the Spartans, that is not lined up facing an allied force standing next to the Spartans, fled immediately at the start of the fighting. To take one example, at Coronea, Xenophon informs us that the Argive soldiers opposite the Spartans and King Agesilaus, quote, did not even wait for the attack of the soldiers around Agesilaus, unquote, but fled right away. Note seven. Other parts of the battle had more mixed results, with the Thebans defeating some allies of the Spartans, but other Spartan allies prevailing. Similar events unfolded at Mantinea, 
and in the tearless battle. These flights from a portion of the battle line not surprisingly enabled the Spartan side to win the overall battles. I'm unaware of this ever happening for non-Spartans in any major classical hoplite battle. The men lined up opposite the Spartans acted as if they knew they would lose because they were facing the invincible Spartans after all. So what was the point in contesting with arms? Better to get a head start in the running and save themselves if they could. Other military clashes on record showed similar tendencies among Sparta's foes, if in less dramatic fashion than these three. Note eight. But as impressive as it is to win a battle with hardly a fight, and as helpful as this would be for a given campaign, a powerful military reputation can have much greater and longer term consequences for projecting power. The research of Press and Cochrane suggests as much. For the Spartans, the key effect would have involved the securing and maintaining of its allies. Scholars have long understood the strength of Sparta's alliance system. GEM de Saint-Croix called the Peloponnesian League, quote, the strongest force in Greek politics for two centuries, note nine. More than any other hegemonic state in Greece of the fifth and fourth centuries, Sparta relied on allies to project its power. This was especially true in the decades immediately prior to Leuctra when Spartan oliganthropy forced it to rely ever more on them. By comparison, Athens in the days of its empire could darken the seas with triremes all by itself. The Thebans in the time of Epaminondas often fought and won with only fellow Boeotians at their side. Philip's Macedonians required no vast allied contingents to fill out their battle line. But the Spartans nearly always fought as a small colonel within a much larger force. This did not go unnoticed by the Greeks themselves. Pericles in the funeral oration at 239 scoffed at the way Spartan armies would only set foot in Attica in the company of hordes of Confederates, while Athenians, he asserted, would fight and win by their arms alone. Xenophon has a Corinthian discussing Spartan forces make the analogy to a river, which is small at its beginning, but becomes wide and hard to deal with farther down when a multitude of tributaries flow into it. Note 10, this was an apt description of what it was like to deal with the Peloponnesian League expedition. In 431 BC and succeeding years, the relative trickle of two to 3,000 Spartan hoplites, which would set out for Archidamus's annual invasions of Attica, became a flood of 30 to 60,000 total troops by the time the full force gathered at the Isthmus and proceeded to Attica, according to our best estimates. Note 11. No wonder the Athenians followed Pericles' admonitions not to leave their city walls and try to fight the invaders, grievous though the sight of their burning villages and farmhouses was. Sparta's ability to summon thousands or tens of thousands of hoplites to fight alongside its own soldiers in practically any encounter was the key to its hegemonic power on the Greek mainland. With such forces at its command, Sparta could pick its fights almost at will. Who would be so foolish as to assault such a power on one's own? Not the Athenians. They didn't begin the Peloponnesian War, nor did they succeed in doing anything more invasive than raid the fringes of Laconia and Messenia. Not the Argives or Thebans. For all their several wars with the Spartans between 500 and 371 BC, not once did either manage to assault Spartan territory, but always found themselves fighting defensively at or near their own homeland. Sparta's weighty alliances gave it not just manpower, but the power to intimidate, and thus the ability to choose most of its wars and the battlefields upon which they would be fought. But many members of the League, Arcadian cities, Elis, others, were also rivals of each other and occasionally of their alliance leader. Sources suggest they despised or distrusted the Spartans, even when fighting alongside them. Xenophon, for example, talks of the Mantineans rejoicing upon hearing of the trouble Iphicrates, an Athenian commander, caused a Spartan column at Lycaon in 390. Later, he notes that the allies in the battle line at Leuctra were not unhappy at seeing the catastrophe that befell the Spartans there. Pausanias claims longstanding hostility towards the Spartans among those fighting alongside them. Note 12 for these. Why would allies fight alongside the Spartans with the regularity and the numbers we know they did, 
despite the rivalries and animosity. I submit that Sparta's military reputation played a central role. Allies repeatedly observing Sparta demonstrate great skill in major battles had every incentive to stay in line next to them rather than face off against them. Celebrations of Spartan valor, such as the monuments at Thermopylae or poets victory odes or Herodotus's histories would have reinforced an idea that was already fixed in their minds. Jonathan Mercer's work on reputation in international conflicts would also predict that city-state leaders would think this way. According to Mercer, allies as outsiders to one another, always having the potential to become rivals, can form strong opinions about each other's dispositions based on observed behavior. Especially likely is the confirmation of previous negative opinions, in this case, about the dangerous warfighting capabilities of Sparta. Note 13. In this way, Sparta's fearsome reputation would have remained alive in the minds of its allies, as well as its adversaries. But this is a theoretical argument. Is there more concrete evidence? It can be hard in the discipline of history to demonstrate why something did not happen, as opposed to something that did. In this case, what failed to happen was widespread frequent defection from Sparta's longstanding coalition of allies, despite their animus. My solution is to find cases where widespread defection did happen and examine what changed. Doing this in the case of Sparta's coalition emphatically confirms the presumption that military reputation played a leading role in keeping Sparta's allies in line. For on those rare occasions when the Spartans were humiliated in battle, not just defeated, but humiliated, the resultant puncturing of the mystique of the vaunted homoioi led to a cascade of deserting allies and crises in Spartan hegemony. Such punctures happened exactly twice in the fifth and early fourth centuries, both times with dramatic results. The first occasion was the defeat and surrender of the Spartans trapped on the island of Sphacteria in 425 BC during the Peloponnesian War. That such a surrender seemed natural to, seems natural to us, the Athenians had the Spartan defenders cornered, battered, starved, and vastly outnumbered, so of course soldiers will surrender in such circumstances, is irrelevant. To the contemporary Greeks, these were not ordinary soldiers. They were the legendary Spartan homoioi, 120 of them, together with 172 other men, presumably Perioikoi and Helots. The Spartiates were supposed to bravely hold their position, obedient to their orders, until the last man died fighting, as had happened at Thermopylae. Instead, the situation being hopeless, they all simply gave up. Note 14. Thucydides reports that this occurrence surprised the Greeks more than any other in the war, a remarkable statement for a 27-year-long conflict that encompassed many stunning events, including the obliteration of an Athenian armada sent to Sicily, and the sudden onset of a devastating plague. But Thucydides is clear. Quote, this event caused much more surprise among the Hellenes than anything else that happened in the war. The general impression had been that Spartans would never surrender their arms, whether because of hunger or any other form of compulsion. Instead, they would keep them to the last and die fighting as best they could. It was hard to believe that those who had surrendered were the same sort of people as those who had fallen. Indeed, there was an occasion afterwards when an Athenian ally, in order to insult one of the prisoners from the island, asked him whether it was the ones who had fallen that were the real Spartans. The reply was that spindles, by which he meant arrows, would be worth a great deal if they could pick out brave men from cowards, a remark which was intended to show that the ones who died were simply the ones who came in the way of the stones and arrows, unquote. Note 15. Thucydides' report of the questions that the Spartan prisoners had to endure in the aftermath serves to emphasize the shock that the event occasioned and the questioning of the Spartan reputation. Compounding the humiliation of Sphacteria Island was the Spartan state's cringing behavior in the aftermath of the surrender. Rather than count these disgraced soldiers as casualties of war and carry on as before, the Spartans sent envoy after envoy to Athens to try to come to a settlement and recover the prisoners. When the Athenians refused to make any accommodation and threatened to execute the prisoners if Attica were invaded, Sparta meekly complied, ceased their invasions, and played defense in the Peloponnese for fear of Helot rebellion. Garrisons were spread out over a large area, and when confronted with enemies, the Spartans behaved with passivity 
and a conspicuous lack of bravery, according to Thucydides. Note 16. When two years later, Sparta finally got Athens to make peace, an unwelcome move to some of Sparta's allies, the Peloponnesian League fell apart. Sparta's decision to begin the war with Athens had been a Peloponnesian League decision, after all, driven in part by the complaints of Sparta's allies. When Sparta convinced the Athenians to grant a peace in 421, allies Corinth, Thebes, and others were incensed. Corinth did not merely defect from the League, but encouraged Sparta's old foe Argos to set itself up as a rival power in the Peloponnese and invite allies to their new coalition. Elis and Mantinea abandoned Sparta to join up. Thebes and Megara wavered on the point of doing the same. As Thucydides explains, Sparta then realized that it had to do something about Argos's coalition or it would lose more allies. So the Spartans marched out with their own forces and all the remaining allies they could muster and challenged Argos. Fence sitters like Boeotia and Corinth decided in the end to help Sparta, but only after the hated Athenians had thrown in with the Argives. What followed was the Battle of Mantinea in 418, with Argos and some members of the former Peloponnesian League on one side, and Sparta with the dwindled remainder on the other. Note 17. If Argos had prevailed in this great clash, the history of the Peloponnese and of Greece would no doubt have been very different. But Sparta won, and in the following years they were able to rebuild their shattered alliance. Why? Because, we're told, the smashing victory at Mantinea had repaired their damaged reputation. Thucydides explains, quote, so by this one action, they did away with all the reproaches that had been leveled against them by the Hellenes at this time, whether for cowardice because of the disaster on the island or for incompetence and lack of resolution on other occasions. It was now thought that though they might have been cast down by fortune, they were still in their own selves the same as they had always been. Note 18. In all, Thucydides' account of the events from the humiliation on the island to the near collapse of the Spartan alliance and the restoration after the Battle of Mantinea is most instructive. The fundamental issue the account shows had been the Spartan military reputation, a reputation cast down by the unaccountable shame of Sphacteria Island. But the decisive victory at Mantinea restored the Spartan legend, in part by spurring a less damaging reinterpretation of the earlier defeat. Sparta, having trounced its rival Argos in battle, was soon able to resume its uncontested leadership of the Peloponnesian League. Note 19. A second great humiliation of Sparta several decades later resulted in a similar pattern of alliance disintegration. This time, however, no subsequent resounding victory in battle would enable the restoration of Spartan hegemony. I'm referring, of course, to Leuctra. In 371, the Thebans and other Boeotians led by the Theban general Epaminondas crushed the Spartiate contingent within a larger allied force. Epaminondas did so with an innovative plan. He concentrated his best troops, the elite sacred band and the Theban phalanx into a formation 50 ranks deep and situated them on the left side of his line opposite the Spartiates, not the right as would have been normal. The aim was clearly to target and destroy the fearsome Spartan troops deployed in their traditional position of honor on the right rather than face off against Sparta's allies on the left. Note 20. It was a bold idea and must have seemed counterintuitive or even foolish at the time, but in the end it worked brilliantly. While the Spartans fought tenaciously against the 50 ranks of Thebans and the sacred band aimed at them, they were eventually ground down and defeated. Fully 400 of the 700 Spartan homoioi present perished in the fighting. The rest were forced to flee, ending the battle in defeat. Flight by overwhelmed hoplites was normal in phalanx clashes. It was how most ended, with one side driven backward from the point of contact and forced to retreat in orderly fashion or not. But fleeing a battle was exceedingly rare for the Spartans and brought deep shame upon them. When the news of the disaster reached Sparta, King Agesilaus had to let the laws sleep for a day to avoid having to disenfranchise hundreds of badly needed citizens on grounds of cowardice. Sparta's allies seem to have been largely untouched in the battle, though whether this had to do with a Theban plan to avoid them or their own reluctance is unclear. Note 21. 
However, as a consequence of this humiliating defeat, in which the Spartan soldiers had been singled out for a thrashing in full view of enemies and allies, the Spartan alliance collapsed. When the next campaign season arrived in 370 BC, almost all the Arcadian cities had fallen away from Sparta amid a civil struggle that resulted in the creation of a new democratic and very anti-Spartan federal league there. Arcadia was known for its large population of capable fighters, and for decades, Sparta had relied on Mantinea, Tegea, Orchomenos, and other Arcadians to fill out its battle line. Elis also rebelled, asserting control of territory Sparta had earlier denied it. Many Perioikic communities, outlying towns in Laconia and Messenia that the Spartiates depended on in war, revolted, and the Helots of Messenia did so en masse. Note 22. A few city-states did remain loyal, including Corinth, Phleas, and Epidaurus. But the bottom line was that not enough allies remained to manpower challenge Sparta for it to offer effective resistance when Epaminondas mounted large-scale invasions of Laconia in 370 and 369. The Theban leader marched in with Boeotian armies swelled by many of Sparta's former allies. Essentially unchallenged, Epaminondas raided Spartan lands freely but more importantly, use these campaigns to render the current Spartan eclipse permanent by establishing an independent state in the land of Messenia and helping the newly federated Arcadians build a capital city at Megalopolis. By means of these moves, he broke Spartan power. With most of its allies and almost half its territory cut away from it, and as few as 700 full Spartiate citizens left alive, the days of Spartan hegemony were gone, never to return. These two episodes of military humiliation, the surrender on Sphacteria Island and the rout at Leuctra, followed by alliance disintegration, underscore the strong relationship between Sparta's reputation and the adherence of their allies. They confirm the presumptions derived from social science research and common sense that Sparta was able to maintain its formidable coalition of allies over the decades, in large part because of its matchless military reputation. Which brings us back to the decades before Leuctra, a time when Sparta was at the very height of its influence in Greece, despite rising internal social discord, land concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, allies and enemies resentful about Sparta's grasping imperial policies, and above all, a Spartiate fighting population shrunk into the smallest levels ever in its history. The only way it was able to continue to project power, to cow opponents, to preside over advantageous peace deals, and when necessary, to fight and win battles, was because of its ability to maintain its coalition of allies, the Peloponnesian League, despite their grumbling. To be sure, it helped that at occasional battles like Coronea in, and 394, the foes facing the Spartans took off in a rout before the battle began in fear of the Homoioi. But the more important effect of its fearsome reputation was to act as glue keeping the coalition together. As long as no humiliating defeats punctured the mystique of its invincible soldiers, Sparta's frailty via oliganthropia could be hidden behind ranks and ranks and ranks of allied troops who counted themselves lucky to be on the side of the perennial winners. When the myth was punctured, you have the perfect recipe for that curious thing, a devastating fall without visible prior decline. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Robinson, for this uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, lecture. And uh, you touch a lot of uh, very important points, and you give to me many uh, opportunity uh, for thinking about uh, a new point of view. So, as uh, Professor Watts uh, uh, wrote, uh, please, uh, for the discussion, uh, type uh, Q for question in chat and uh, C for comment. And uh, I think uh, Professor Cartledge, uh, maybe um, Eric, you can read uh, uh, alone what uh, Professor Cartledge wrote. Very interesting. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I'll be, I'll be checking it out. Oh, did you want me to read that or as a question? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, great talk, Eric. Thanks. Sorry I have to leave, but would be glad to know your view of, of Mike Cole, The Bronze Lie. Uh, MC has a not quite flawless Ready Reckoner Sparty, Spartan military record printed immediately before page 225, grist to his mill, that Sparta warrior supremacy was but a myth. So and my response is, I haven't seen this. So I want, I want to go look at this and, uh, and, and see what he has to say. Okay, so uh, we have uh, another uh, um, indication for a new book and a few are new, uh, interesting, very, very new because I see 2021. 2021, so yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not gonna um, slap myself too hard for not having seen this yet, but um, <laughs> I will definitely need to check it out. Spartan Warrior Supremacy was uh, Okay, and uh, oh, oh, actually, let, let me go ahead and, and jump in substantively to this extent. Um, I, I haven't seen this, so I, 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 I might be misrepre misrepresenting it. But if, if uh, uh, Paul Cartledge is right and his thesis is that Spartan warrior supremacy was but a myth, I would actually disagree with this. I, I don't think Spartans, uh, the Spartan warrior supremacy was a myth. I, I uh, agree with Aristotle and others who said that largely due to the training that the Spartan um, hoplites underwent, um, the Spartans were actually pr better fighters than most of the hoplite armies that they came into contact with. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I don't think it was a myth at all. My contention is rather both and, it's that, um, they were excellent fighters, better than many or most um, of, that they encountered in the Greek world. But because of this, and because of dramatic events like what happened at Thermopylae, they developed this special, unique mystique about themselves. Um, and that it's the operation of this mystique, together with the fact that they could fight well, that helped explain their ability to project power. So. I'll get in that shot before I've even read the guy's book. <laughs> but I see that Eduard uh, wants to make, please. Eric, I thought this was absolutely wonderful. I really, really enjoyed it. And I've been doing a little bit of playing around with Zama um, and Hannibal's strategy at Zama, which was to hold his Italian veterans in reserve and basically um, have them confront Scipio's army. Um, after Scipio had, in a sense, dealt with the elephants and dealt with the frontline allied troops. It's a similar thing to it sounds like what the Spartiates are doing. And I'm, I'm wondering about um, how we should evaluate Scipio's success then, um, because these are, of course, veterans. These are, of course, in a way, not two centuries of Spartiates, but these are people that Romans are scared of simply because of their reputation. So should we evaluate Scipio differently and understand the victory at Zama differently because of what, what he does to counteract this reputation that Hannibal is kind of using in a similar way? Or is this just so different that um, we, you know, the Spartans are so unique, we can't use that to understand um, other kinds of circumstances elsewhere? That's really interesting. Um... Yeah, I think maybe so, but uh, it, it's been it's been long enough since I've looked at Zama and what happened there that I I, I don't want to venture and and say that we should give more or less credit to Scipio for this reason. But the point you raise is very interesting. I I think that so the Battle of Leuctra, um, it's controversial on how we reconstruct it. I gave a very sort of straightforward, uh, vague um, uh, recap of how Leuctra happened. But if we can believe some of our sources, the key thing that happened at Leuctra, one of the key things was Epaminondas deciding to deploy the sacred band to have them attack the Spartiate core of the Spartan army um, first, um, ahead of the 50 rank deep uh, Theban phalanx. And that this was important. I think it was Plutarch who, who claims this maneuver in particular. Um, and if that's how it happened, um, I think that's significant for a reason similar to the one you're talking about with Scipio and Zama, uh, because the, 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 the thing that the Paminatus could count on with the sacred band is because of their special training and the special bonds that they have, and perhaps if we believe the Battle of Tagira in 375 happened the way Plutarch describes it, 
their experience in fighting Spartans and their relative lack of fear of the Spartans, it was absolutely key to have this small group of elites start the engagement. Epaminondas could count on them not running, not being terrified by the Spartan reputation, but fully engaging the Spartans right at the beginning, and then the rest of the Theban army would follow, There'd be, meaning there's no danger of just sort of shying away or running away from, from the Spartans. So um, if that's how the battle transpired, I, I think we should perhaps give Epaminondas credit um, and the Sacred Band credit for their, their bravery in a similar way that you're suggesting maybe we should be um, crediting Scipio. Yeah, that's actually just to quickly follow up. That's super interesting because the formation that Scipio sends against the veterans is Triarii and Principis. But the Triarii are, of course, like the Roman version of the Sacred Band, the, the veterans, the hardcore grizzled people. So it's actually a quite interesting way to think about that. Thanks. Sure. Thank you so much. There is a comment, uh, Audit. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Thank you for bringing into light another factor of winning wars in the ancient world, other than manpower, finance, etc. Interesting to think that reputation could win battles. <laughs> okay. I think. I agree. Uh, Yes, <laughs> I think there is a question from uh, uh, Stephen Atkinson, please. Okay, um, thank you very much, Eric, for a really stimulating talk, and it's good to see you again after uh, many years. It's been years. Um, Tell me where I was wrong, Stephen. Tell me everywhere I'm wrong. Well, <laughs> perhaps by email afterwards. Um, but uh, the, the question that, that, that I have now is, um, you focus mainly on the late 5th and early 4th centuries, um, but the story goes back, as you said, to the reputation that Sparta builds up at Thermopylae and to a lesser extent at Plataea. Um, um, my puzzle though is why within 10 to 15 years of those two battles, Sparta has to face two major uh, military challenges from within its alliance, as described in Herodotus 9.35, the uh, um, battle against the Tegeans and the Argives, and then the Battle of De Pace against all the Arcadians, uh, apart from the Mantineans. Um, if the Spartan reputation was so strong um, as a result of Thermopylae and Plataea, um, why do its allies feel emboldened to challenge it militarily uh, just a few years later? Excellent question. Boy, I wish we knew more about um, uh, De Pea and those other battles that Herodotus just so briefly um, refers to. In fact, you know, when I, in my talk, when I talked, when I said there were sort of two great crises um, in Sparta's alliance system, both of which followed humiliations, um, I, I wonder whether if we knew more, um, we should say that somewhere in the, uh, you know, at the time of these battles in sort of the mid fifth century, there was a similar disintegration. Um, or maybe these, this wasn't a disintegration of alliance, maybe it was sort of an individual challenge by one, you know, Arcadian city and, and we just don't know the politics of what was going on there and what caused Sparta to have to fight these wars. Um, Thucydides also refers to the fact that Sparta had to fight some wars at this time in the Pentaconta Tia. Um, so um, I, this, is a, this is an excellent point. Um, I guess in response, um, in sort of in defense of my thesis, um, I, I guess I don't mean to say that it was Thermopylae and Plataea that established this reputation and that was it. Um, I think that Thermopylae is the earliest point we can um, establish that this reputation existed. It's, it's from events from Thermopylae and after, and sources that come from Thermopylae and after, of course, most of our sources come from Thermopylae and after, um, that start discussing you know, the superlative qualities of, of Spartan soldiers. Um, so I, I see sort of Thermopylae as a beginning point, but of course, before Thermopylae, I mean, Sparta had a sterling reputation before Thermopylae. They presumably were chosen to lead the Hellenic League defense against the Persians um, for a reason. Um, maybe it was just power politics and that they were the head of the Peloponnesian League 
and thus the natural um, Greek state to, to lead the Greek resistance. But it also could have been that because of um, uh, the Lycurgan reforms or um, uh, the uh, and uh, reforms that have been taking place in Sparta probably down through the sixth century and the process of Sparta um, uh, building the Peloponnesian League in the course of the sixth century, that their reputation was increasing already. Thermopylae was sort of a most celebrated uh, point in it. Um, but, uh, uh, and then it continued, uh, right? It, it, it ended up um, uh, getting through these battles uh, 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 in the Peloponnese in the mid fifth century um, victoriously. Um, and then they win Tanagra. Um, and uh, they, you know, uh, the Pel and then the Peloponnesian War is next. All these things um, would sort of uh, uh, act to build a reputation. But um, it's a very good question. And I don't have a definite answer. If it, if it worked, um, if reputation worked that once you've acquired it, you can't lose or you can't be challenged at all, then that wouldn't have happened. So I think that's an indication that, you know, that reputation isn't something that you can absolutely count on absolutely preventing any kind of dissension. Uh, because clearly those were cases, and I suspect there were others, if, I, uh, if we looked at the record carefully, or other times um, when one state or another, despite all the factors of Spartan reputation, decides to you know, um, uh, uh, oppose the Spartans. Um, but anyway, that, that's a, that, that was a good point. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there is another commentaries and questions. Uh, if uh, there isn't, I, I would like uh, to ask uh, a question, maybe a provocation, uh, but uh, I, I wait. So, um, Professor Page de Bois, please. Please, can you ask? Please. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. And I have a question about the anachronism of using social scientific notions of reputation to describe this ancient situation. Um, I wonder if you can defend that kind of um, use of a deeply anachronistic model for describing this ancient um, situation that you are interested in. And also if you see a difference between um, notions of reputation in these two different worlds, the 20, 20th and 21st century um, that would modify your understanding of, of what you've described. Okay, well, that, that's an excellent point. And um, indeed, uh, I think one needs to be very cautious. Um, I, I made use of the modern analyses of state reputation in part because um, I thought it would be kind of irresponsible to try to build a whole theory about um, um, state reputation and its effects in, in, um, in one historical era in, in ancient history without paying attention to sort of the general research um, which aims to uh, draw uh, questionable or not um, broad conclusions about um, in the history of the world or at least the history of modern times um, how you know state actors tend to uh, tend to behave, but sure we you can't just uh, you can't just import the results and assume them to be um, efficacious for the ancient world. Results based on studies of wars that have happened in the last two hundred years. Political scientists all the time make use of these data sets that have been collected of um, sort of of conflicts and their results, and they're sort of standardized data sets that get updated periodically for basically wars going back um, to sort of the beginning of the 19th century or, or before. And, you know, they, they, they uh, put, you can sort of do almost mathematical calculations based on, you know, winners and looters, losers and who were the allies and who weren't and come to kind of to statistical um, conclusions about the effects of this condition versus that condition. 
Now, these modern wars are, are being fought in very different ways by different peoples than the ancient conflicts. So um, I wouldn't dream of saying that because um, Catherine McNabb Cochran's results show that um, uh, people tend not to challenge uh, uh, states that do well in war, uh, in previous wars, that that means that's how it worked in Greece. Um, Greece wasn't part of her data set, but I see it as suggestive. I see it as suggestive of the ways that um, political leaders looking out for uh, the benefit of their community, be it a city, state, or a nation, might be thinking the way they might perceive the world. And um, the fact that they're based on uh, some of this research anyway, uh, is based on social science research about um, sort of human biases and the way we see the world. That's Those, of course, aren't automatically transferable to the ancient world either. But right. um, um, I, I, I again uh, I take it as sort of inspiration for uh, suggestions for how the way things might have worked. So um, that's sort of how I um, I use them in the in the talk. I just you know went on for a minute or two about that to sort of set the possibilities for how things have worked in the modern world, and then take a look at the ancient evidence. I think the ancient evidence has got to be the main um, the main decider, not um, not the latest. Uh, modern theories. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, there is uh, uh, two other questions. I ask, uh, please, uh, uh, to make a very uh, brief, uh, very um, little um, question, but I want uh, to say hello to Professor Engels. Uh, it's uh, very nice to see you again. Please, Professor Engels. So that's a brief question. We learned some details about Sparta's attempts to modernize uh, its league after 403 and make it more effective by, by several reforms, um, which did not work out completely successful, as, as I would think. Uh, how would you estimate um, this, the effect of, of this uh, attempt to, to modernize the league um, if we see the, the rapid uh, yeah, decline of, of the league after the military defeat at Lutra? Well, um, I, I, I guess I'm going to have to ask you um, specifically what reforms you're, you're referring to. I mean, the, uh, go ahead. They, they were, I think I remember they were trying to uh, have some financial contributions from their allies. Mm -hmm. Um, to be able to cope with the problems of financing the war which they had in the Peloponnesian War some years earlier. Right. Well, there, yeah, there, there were calls for contributions from even, mm. even during the Peloponnesian War. Um, mm. uh, the, so after the Peloponnesian War, I mean, uh, uh, this is not a very well understood phenomenon because we don't have a lot of sources that talk about it, but Sparta seems to take over um, large portions of the former Athenian Empire in the Aegean and to require payments of some kind from its members to support Sparta's sort of now possession of what, what was now a real empire. Um, now that empire lasted less than a decade because in the course of the Corinthian War, um, the, the Spartan um, fleet was defeated by um, an, an Athenian-led Persian fleet. Yeah. And um, they lost that empire. And so Sparta was sort of back to its traditional Peloponnesian League arrangements in which it wasn't trying to financially support you know, uh, fleets of ships. But we know mercenaries were being hired and used more frequently and, and there would have been need for to pay these mercenaries. And one imagines Sparta was um, uh, eager to get contributions to help with that. But, you know, I don't see in the record this having a powerful effect, sort of new arrangements within the league having a powerful effect on whether allies fought alongside the Spartans, whether they went along with the Spartans with this or that war or campaign. Um, I think much more dramatic are uh, the, the, the sort of the, the indications that we find from who gets ranged on one side versus another in the Corinthian war, 
you know, important members of, of the Peloponnesian League ending up fighting the Spartans. Um, you know, at that point, when you have um, members of the Peloponnesian League, albeit temporarily, you know, defecting from the League, it's, it's no longer a matter of sort of rules of how, how the League is working. It's about um, political calculations that states are making at the time of, of who they want to be allied with and who they want to fight. Thank you so much. And uh, there is another question from of Andrea Pierozzi. Please, uh, uh, Dr. Pierozzi, brief question, please. Well, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm not able to, to put the camera on. Um, um, I have a question. Um, do you think that the, the death of a king is crucial in the context in which Sparta falls? I'm, I'm, I'm considering, for example, of course, the death of Cleombrotus at Leuctra or the death of Arius in the context of the Cremonidian War. Uh, do you think that Sparta has a problem in dealing not only with the losses of a lot of Spartans, but with the loss of the king? Is this a uh, one of the reasons why Sparta falls instead of declining and fall and falling. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Um, so I, I think that the fall of a king would have been much more keenly felt and might have changed some of our narratives of of sort of the collapse of Spartan power if it hadn't been Cleombrotus who died at Leuctra, but Agesilaus. Uh, Agesilaus was apparently still ill, and this is why Cleombrotus had the army in northern Greece, which is the one that invaded Boeotia um, in the in the Leuctra campaign. Um, uh, Agesilaus seems to um, recover um, soon after Leuctra and become the leader that he had formerly been, the dominant leader um, in Spartan politics and foreign policy that he, that he had been before. And so Cleombrotus's death, um, you know, I don't think we can count that as something that that really changes anything that that would have happened um, in terms of fighting off Epaminondas in 370 and 369. Um, I, I don't really see it. Our sources for the battle, I think it's Xenophon anyway, um, who specifies that the Spartan soldiers fought very bravely even after Agesilaus, I mean, Cleombrotus fell. Um, if the accounts had said the king fell and they all ran away, I think I might answer your question more affirmatively, but that's not what the sources seem to indicate. The, the death of the king didn't seem to cause the retreat of the Spartans. So um, I, I, I think that the, the death of leaders in hoplite battles um, uh, don't, uh, oh, don't always have much of an effect. Um, so uh, it seems like when the leader dies, um, usually it looks like the result was already sort of happening, um, though there are some exceptions to that. Um, so anyway, I, I guess I, would, I wouldn't count that as a major factor, though if it was Agesilaus who died at, at Leuctra and then everything fell apart as it actually happened, I think we'd have lots of people arguing, well, the genius of Agesilaus missing from Sparta, that changed everything. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the, there is another question in chat uh, of Malcolm Lowe. Uh, maybe, Eric, you can read better than me uh, because. Uh, there is, no, uh, I'm, I'm, happy uh, if, uh, you, right. I'm happy if you read it out, if sure. you read it out exactly as I wrote it. Sure. One must usually resist the temptation to ask what if questions about history. Nevertheless, a pair of perennial questions remains. What would have been the subsequent military career of Sparta if the Athenians had, one, not decided to restrict citizenship to offspring of two Athenian parents, two, not been fooled into mounting the Sicilian expedition, either after basically winning, its Arc winning the Arcadamian War? Okay, uh, question one, what, if, what, what would have happened if the Athenians had not restricted citizenship the way they had? Um, I'm going to, I mean, speculate wildly in this what if question, which we should never ask. I'm gonna speculate wildly that that wouldn't have had um, uh, so grand an effect. Um, 
in terms of sort of manpower for war fighting, uh, the Athenian, the strength of the Athenians, the power of the Athenians were based on their on their fleets, um, on their triremes, and the people who manned the triremes were not um, predominantly citizens. Um, there were citizens who manned them, there were medics, there were people hired from other parts of the Greek world, there were slaves. Um, lots of people rode in the Athenian fleets, and they didn't seem to have trouble finding crews. The citizenship status or not um, uh, wouldn't have affected it greatly. And uh, Athens' fate tended not to, to turn on how they did in a hoplite battle um, in case um, uh, those numbers would have been a bit larger if they had. So I, I'm, I, I'm going to guess uh, uh, that, that one wouldn't have changed much. Two, uh, what if the Athenians had not mounted the Sicilian expedition? Well, now that's different. Um, I think that I wouldn't be alone in guessing that if the Athenians had listened to Nicias and not, uh, uh, and not Alcibiades, and uh, avoided the, the temptation to go try to conquer Sicily, um, that the entire latter, later portion of the, of the Peloponnesian War would have been fought in a way much more to the Athenian advantage. Um, they didn't lose the war after Sicily, of course, but for the entirety of the rest of the war, they were like one major naval defeat away from, from losing the whole thing because of the resources the people that they had lost in Sicily. Um, if they had resisted that temptation and been more conservative, I'm sounding very Thucydidean here. If they had listened to Pericles, you know, and been more defensive, um, they would have been in much better shape um, in the rest of the war. So I'll say yes. maybe yes on two, but not on one. How about that? Uh, if I could say about one, uh, one of the things that uh, enabled Rome to create a worldwide empire was its readiness to extend citizenship uh, to larger and larger populations. And if some of these people that you mentioned on the fleet uh, had had the opportunity to become uh, Athenian citizens, uh, it again, this, uh, and then of course, uh, create new Athenian families and so on. Uh, in the case, as opposed to Sparta, which, uh, as as you say, re restricted itself to small and smaller numbers, uh, in the, the battle of numbers, the Athenians would have been in a better position. I, let me let me jump in and agree with you to this extent. If it's if it wasn't about extending citizenship just more broadly among the Athenian population, but mm -hmm. extending citizenship within the across the whole empire bringing in exactly. members yeah. of the Delian League as equal partners with the Athenians and uh, forget about the tribute and you get to be full citizens, full Athenian. Maybe it's hard to imagine that the Athenians could have done that, but if they had been made that sort of dramatic change, well then uh, we're back to a, a hypothetical that really could have changed things. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Lou, I ask if uh, there is another question or comment. If uh, there is not, uh, I wait. I give uh, the word and the floor to Professor Edward Watts, please. So I want to first thank Professor Robinson for a really wonderful talk, and I want to thank Professor Bucciantini for a uh, great moderating of the questions. Um, I will conclude by just um, sharing again the uh, schedule for the upcoming second half of our program. So our next lecture is September 24th, uh, Radical Democracy, Decline and Fall by Stefania De Vito from Venezia. Um, and as you can see, we have a full run of things that go all the way through January. So we hope that everyone who has joined us today will join us for the other ones. And if there are talks that you know people will be interested in seeing, please do feel free to send along as well notifications of that. And um, we look forward to the second part of this. It's been a wonderful first run. And I think uh, Professor Robinson has really gotten us started on a great foot uh, as we're moving forward. So thank you all. And uh, we will hopefully see